The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, the Bible Belt is about to burst. It's just not okay. Get the healthy eating plan that's ripped straight from scriptures. I lost 65 pounds just by eating God's food. Then, an all-day Coke binge. I used cocaine from 9 a.m. all the way until like 6 o'clock that morning. Nearly kills one junkie. I felt my spirit was literally leaving my body. The life-saving second chance. Because I knew that that was my only hope. On today's 700 Club. Welcome to this edition of the 700 Club. A catastrophic storm in the Atlantic, Dorian, set to swoop down on Labor Day. Residents from Florida to South Carolina bracing for a monster hurricane. Will it become a Cat 4? Meteorologist Joe Bastardi is joining us now uh, to give us the storm's track. And here's Heather Sells. Just in time for the holiday weekend, Hurricane Dorian is moving towards the U.S. mainland. Forecasters expect it to strengthen and hit anywhere from Florida to South Carolina. I've been through Andrew, I've been through Wilmer, I've been through Irma, and I don't want to go through this one. <laughs> the National Hurricane Center says Dorian will only get stronger, and that has people in Florida and along the East Coast getting ready. On Wednesday, Dorian's high winds ripped the Virgin Islands, knocking out power to two islands. But it largely spared Puerto Rico, centering about 90 miles north of San Juan. It's a huge relief for the U.S. territory, still struggling to rebuild homes and its power grid after Hurricane Maria. This satellite video shows lightning in the eye of the storm as it passed, an indication of how quickly it's strengthening. Dorian has now moved out to open waters. Forecasters say it will grow into a dangerous Category 3 storm. A major hurricane uh, by Saturday is what we're expecting, and then continue to a major hurricane as we get really close to the Florida coastline. As Dorian approaches the U.S., new reports show the Trump administration taking money out of FEMA. $155 million going from the FEMA Disaster Fund to support detention facilities on the border. Regardless, the president has promised that FEMA will do a great job responding to Dorian. You must have an evacuation plan. Uh, be sure to fill your gas tank. For now, the pressure is on in Florida and up the East Coast. Florida's governor has declared a state of emergency, and he's calling on residents to gather seven days' worth of supplies and follow this storm closely. Heather Sell, CBN News. Well, here to give us his analysis on Dorian's track is Joe Bustarty, Joe's chief meteorologist for Weather Bell Analytics. Joe, good to have you back with us again. Listen, is this thing going to hit Florida? Will it go Cat 5, do you think? I don't think it'll go Cat 5, but we think it uh, uh, has a good shot at Cat 4. What it's going to be, though, Pat, is a fist of fury. It's not going to be like Irma, where Irma was spread out all over the place. You know, Irma had hurricane-force winds extending 150 miles out from the center. This one's going to be much more focused and concentrated. And uh, part of the reason is the weather pattern over the Caribbean and in the Western Atlantic in general is not that favorable in the large scale. So the storm has to stay small. It is going to stay small, relatively speaking. It's not going to be one of these things where the storm's hitting Florida and already the clouds are into North Carolina. Remember how big Irma was. But that being said, if it stays small, once it makes the bend back to the west, that's when you'll see some intensification. Already this morning, uh, some of the drier air that has been around has tried to work its way into the storm, and it's been fighting that. But you also notice, folks, it would not go west into the Caribbean. If it had gone west into the Caribbean, it would just die into the Central Caribbean. That's a graveyard of storms at this time of the year. It becomes more productive for development in the Caribbean later in the year. But right now, this is heading right for the area that in our preseason forecast, we said you got to look out for outside of the Caribbean. So it's, a, it's an ugly looking situation. So what can those residents expect? Those in, say, Fort Lauderdale or in the path of the storm? 
Well, we, we've still got several days. It is, you know, my, my favorite saying with the weather is only God knows tomorrow. The rest of us just guess. But uh, the fact is that looking at this, it's going to be approaching that area uh, Sunday night and Monday. Now, the slower it moves, the slower it moves, the better the chance it tries to turn northwest just up to the east coast of Florida. And uh, that would mean that well, they'd have a formidable storm from Fort Lauderdale to Jacksonville, but if the center stayed just offshore, it'd be like what you had in Matthew. Remember, Matthew stayed just offshore. And as a matter of fact, the end game of this could be very close to Matthew, where you have a storm that's hugging the coast all the way up to North Carolina, perhaps Virginia Beach. So it, it'd be about a week from now, uh, this could be impacting folks all the way up into the mid-Atlantic states. But for right now, my take is that on this northwest path, it'll hold its own, maybe uh, fluctuate up and down. But once it turns to the west, you know, the old-time meteorologist, I guess I'm getting to be there now, 64, mm -hmm. but I was taught when you see these storms bend and come back to the west, look out, that's when they're going to really intensify. Well, Joe, let me ask you this. Uh, this is hurricane really number one, I guess, this season. What's, what do you think is coming down the road? Well, I think, you, I think again, uh, much of the area that got devastated by Irma, you notice how uh, Irma and um, uh, Maria and the, the Caribbean, much of that area has probably got lower than normal activity. The problem is, Pat, we forecasted what we call scattershot season, where things that, things that get in close to the United States coast, you saw what happened with Barry, right, intensified near the coast. This is the same kind of situation. So the definition of an active season, even though the total season may be at or below normal, an active season to me is if I get hit by a hurricane, it's an active season, and we definitely have this southeast United States threat now. Well, Joe, I appreciate it. And please come back, and I want to stay with you as <laughs> to so what's happening. Appreciate it very much. Well, Pat, Pat why, don't you have, why don't you have me on when there's a big high-pressure system around? Everybody's going to associate me with terrible weather. <laughs> we'll get some beautiful weather coming up. This will be the man to forecast the beautiful sky, sunny skies and following winds. I so, love it. All right. Well, in other news, the British Parliament is closed for business. Why? It's the Prime Minister's latest action to pass Brexit. John Jessup has more on that. And Pat, Queen Elizabeth did not object to Boris Johnson's request to suspend Parliament until mid-October, just two weeks before a vote on Brexit. Opponents say it's a coup d'etat, making it harder for Brexit opponents to press for a better deal as the UK leaves the European Union. This is about trying to stop a majority in Parliament coming together to avoid a no-deal Brexit. Johnson says it's not an attack on democracy and that he has good reasons for, for suspending Parliament. Brexit supporters say they will oppose Johnson if he tries to negotiate a new deal. However, they do support, Pat, a clean break from the EU. Well, you know, I want to say, folks, that is going to be very dangerous. So what about tariffs? What about the... Uh, workers back and forth. What about trade back and forth? All this has got to be worked out, and none of it is going to be worked out. It's going to be a clean break. They're going to leave. All right, now, how about Germany? How about France? How about the Great Britain and the uh, Dominion uh, affiliates? What are, the, what are their rights going to be? What about travel? What about visas? None of that's going to be worked out. He's just going to get out. Big mistake. John? Pat, a U.S. cybersecurity stopped, um, attack stopped Iran's Revolutionary Guards from targeting tankers in the Gulf. According to American officials, the June attack destroyed data and computer programs critical for attacks on tankers and other vessels in the Persian Gulf, where 20 percent of the world's crude oil is shipped. U.S. intelligence says Iran is behind attacks on oil tankers in the Gulf and the downing of U.S. drones in May and June. It also seized a British-flagged oil tanker earlier this summer. The attack shut down military communications networks, and Pat, Iran is still trying to retrieve lost information and restart those computer systems. You know, I've been saying this all along. We have, in the United States, the most sophisticated computer system in the world. Why should we stand idly by while those guys hack us and beat us up and take our, steal our data and, and hold us hostage is going on in various states right now as hackers are stealing the data and holding states for ransom. We have the best in the NSA in the world. 
thank the Lord we finally used it. But it's, it's a, a bloodless war. You, you're not shooting people. You're not sending your troops out. But you can disrupt the s supply chains, the command and control of any army anywhere in the world. And I'm just pleased that we finally are using the weapon that has been made available to us. I may add something else. Regent University has a special designation by the NSA. Uh, it's called a National Center of Academic Excellence in Cyber Defense Education. That's not a bad thing. And we now have a degree in cybersecurity, and uh, uh, it's among only, uh, well, it's, it's, it's just the 4% of the universities in the nation that has this uh, honor. We have a, a uh, a beautiful uh, center with, uh, we've now, we, we're, we're ordering, we haven't got it yet, we're ordering an attack feast and we've been, we've been able to model a, a cyber attack, but now we're going to have the necessary software to launch an attack so people can sit at our cyber range at Uni uh, Regent University and uh, can actually learn how to uh, go after the people who are who are uh, these cyber attackers, and it, it's a great education. Well, there's something else that's went on at Regent University, and John's going to tell us about that. That's right, Pat. Speaking of which, Regent University held a special ceremony dedicating its campus chapel yesterday. And our very own 700 Club host, Pat, as chancellor and CEO, was part of that ceremony, dedicating the chapel to businessman, investor, and philanthropist philanthropist Jack, Jack Shaw and his wife Jane. The building is now known as Shaw Chapel. Pat described Jack as a dear friend for decades and led the prayer of blessing over Shaw Chapel, committing it to the Lord. The chapel was originally dedicated on March 22, 2013 and is designed after London's famous St. Martin in the Fields. Pat, looks like you all had a great time together. Well, it was a wonderful time and we had uh, the, the Chancellor's Chapel, the place was full. We had we could hold about a thousand people, and they were all their prospective students. But the Shaw family, Jack, Jack, and his father, uh, Irby, have been friends for years and years and years. I mean, 50, 60 years. And uh, this is a nice thing. They made a significant gift to the university, and we, we're just delighted to see that. Well, the chapel is so beautiful. What a yeah. wonderful legacy they've left. It, it really is. It's a lovely, lovely building. As I say, it's, it's modeled after St. Martin's in the field, which is one of the most famous chapels in the world. It's right in Trafalgar Square, right around from the uh, London uh, Gallery of Art, right in, in London. And this is the famous chapel. And, and this, the outside is, you know, identical to that. Mm -hmm. so well, it now sits in the center place. of the university. Yeah, it's wonderful. a big place. Yeah. Okay. Well, up next, Christians across America packing on the pounds. What's now being done to help the faithful shed the fat? Plus, later on, a vision of a rolling pin and dough, and you'll never guess how it took a home-based business into a worldwide enterprise. That's coming up. You know, the church has been in the forefront against alcoholism, drug addiction, uh, sexual promiscuity. But the one sin that they don't seem to talk about is obesity because they have big church luncheons and dinners and potluck dinners, and they eat their heads off. Lots and lots <laughs> of food. How do you feel about that? Man, you know, I, it got to me. I, in all seriousness, I, I, I had lost a lot of weight when I was in in New York, and I came down, I went to work for uh, Freemason Street Baptist Church as assistant minister, and they had all these luncheons. And what do they have to feed you? They've got a white bread roll, they have mashed potatoes and gravy, some awful string beans, and a couple pieces of uh, roast beef, and that was all. And you had to, if you had anything to eat, you had to eat bad food. And so I started ballooning. My weight started going up, and it was just terrible. I had a hard time getting rid of it. But I have done so, I might add, along the way. And done so well. Done, done so well. I, I weigh less than I did when I was 15 years old, which is probably a good thing. But one doctor now is fighting this epidemic of obesity with a solution that is taken straight from the Scriptures. The result, people are shedding, quote, millions of pounds. 
Here's Laurie Johnson with that. Overall, the church does a pretty good job avoiding unhealthy things like smoking, alcohol, drugs, and promiscuity, but misses the mark when it comes to obesity. Research shows people who begin attending church in their 20s are more likely to become obese by middle age than those who don't go to church. This especially troubled doctor and Christian Daniel Amen. I actually prayed about it because I went to my own church and um, saw them serving hot dogs, donuts, ice cream, bacon, sausage. And I'm like, they're giving you all this food to kill you early. Save them, then kill them. He feels it's high time the church deals with its weight problem. You know, it's just not okay when your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit for churches to basically poison you with low quality food and think, well, that's what we've always done, so it's okay. As a brain imaging specialist, Dr. Amen published two studies showing as weight increases, the brain actually shrinks. It's widely known that obesity lowers quality of life, adds millions to health care costs, and can lead to an early grave. Nationwide, the South leads the pack. And that's also where there are more evangelical Christian churches. And I'm not okay with that you know, the Bible Belt widening. With that in mind, Dr. Amen co-developed a church-based weight loss program known as the Daniel Plan. While the classes last six weeks, the diet is intended as a lifelong discipline. I feel so good now. You know, I swim a mile a day. Uh, I was in a wheelchair at one time. I, I couldn't keep my balance. and But now look at me. 75-year-old Phyllis Neal joined the Daniel Plan at her Yorktown, Virginia church. She suffered from pain, depression, and couldn't sleep due to a number of health issues. Vicodin and Ambium and um, Prozac, and just, I was just on so much stuff. Phyllis ultimately lost 65 pounds, stopped taking medications, felt happy, and began sleeping like a baby. She attributes much of her success to the faith element of the plan. And God just took control, and He has just blessed my life so much. Her 75-year-old husband, Dennis, got on board, too. I lost 65 pounds just by eating God's food. Dennis and Phyllis believe so much in the program that they now teach others. One of the things I tell people in our classes is if God came down today and said, look, I want you to do this task for me, and then you tell him that you're not physically fit to do it because you're overweight, uh, that doesn't work. The Neals emphasize the importance of breaking free from processed foods because of ingredients like MSG, industrialized oils, and high fructose corn syrup diabetes, cancer, all of it's related to sugar. And we got to get that out of our system. We've been hijacked by the food industry. Instead of packaged items, Phyllis fills their kitchen with natural whole foods, free of chemicals and sweeteners, chicken strips, cut up vegetables, boiled eggs, beans, cheese, and nuts. You'll see that I keep fruit available. My grandchildren come in the house. They don't ask for candy here. They go over and get a piece of fruit, and their parents are so happy for them. <laughs> Drinking plenty of water helps us manage our weight because, believe it or not, sometimes our brain tricks us into thinking we're hungry when we're actually just thirsty. People adhering to the Daniel Plan exercise regularly and attend support group meetings. So while obesity continues to plague the church, Christians nationwide are shedding millions of pounds thanks to the Daniel Plan, named after the Bible hero whose diet reflected his commitment to God. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Well, how wonderful the church is leading. Absolutely. You know, I, I got so, something happened. I, I just, uh, a switch turned off and I, I lost about 60 pounds. Yeah, you did. You yeah, I, I weigh less than I did when I was 15 years old. Amazing. But you eat healthy. 
Oh, by the absolutely. I mean, I, I, I understand about fruit. I understand about vegetables. I understand about the appropriate time. And uh, what Lori was talking about, all these processed food, I mean, white flour and sugar, and you get Coca-Colas and all the, the other things with the sweet. There's so much sugar, so you cut that stuff out. And uh, makes a difference. Makes a difference. Yeah. So here I am. <laughs> but I, I, I weed about at least 10 pounds or, or 5 or 10 pounds less than I did when I was 15 wow. years old. That's amazing. So it, it, it meant that there are, um, we've got a dear lady named Rosie who cuts suits down. I had a whole lot of work to do. <laughs> she cut my clothes. Rosie in business. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, it's good for you. That's All right. great. Well, still ahead, voices in her head telling her to kill herself and driving her to cut herself. The out-of-body experience that saved her. That's coming up. Plus, a homemaker with a vision that leads to a multi-million dollar business. The secret to her phenomenal success. And then, a Thursday round of your questions and some honest answers. John says, I'm 70 years old and my wife and I have our retirement in the market. Should we stay in the market with the talk of recession? You'll want to hear what Pat has to say about that, so stay tuned. It's all coming up. Well, it's that time of year again. Fall is upon us, and the staff of CBN sets aside this special week that we call Seven Days Ablaze, where we pray for you, our partners and viewers. So from Monday, September 9th through Friday, September 13th, our staff is going to gather daily at noon to pray for your needs. Listen, if you've already received this mailing containing the prayer brochure, He Cares For You, please take a moment and send us your prayer requests. If you didn't receive this mailing, you can still send us your prayer requests and ask for a free copy of the brochure as well. Just call 1-800-700-7000 or you can visit cbn.com or you can write 7 Days Ablaze, CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia. Our zip code here is 23463. We would love to hear from you. And of course, we'd love to pray for you. So please let us know how we can do that. Time for some questions well, and answers. Let's go ready? for it. Okay, Pat, All this right, first one comes from John who says, I'm 70 years old. My wife and I have our retirement in the market. Do you think we should stay in the market with the talk of recession and the uncertainty of domestic global conditions? Uh, you use the term the market. And I, you know, what is the market? The, there's a huge stock market. There, there, there are overseas markets. There's the uh, small cap market. There's the big cap market. There are all these things. Mm -hmm. uh, there are index funds and so forth. Uh, I certainly think that uh, retirement, the, the price that's being paid now for bonds is just ridiculously low. When the 30-year bond went below 2% and it was selling it to like, uh, well, Less than less than two percent, and the the uh, uh, ten year Treasury was selling uh, at less than a, one and a half percent. I mean, what in the world are you going to put your money in? Uh, I, I think there's some very very sound stocks. You ought to find stocks that are solid, that have double A, triple A ratings, that have been paying dividends for many many years, that are in a, 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 a type of business that is pretty much shielded from what's going on. And if you put funds into something, a balanced program like this, uh, but I, I don't know, you know, individual investing, I, I, I prefer myself to these so-called index funds. But uh, uh, you say, I'm in the market. I mean, basically speaking, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, a money market fund is not going to do anything except give you your money back. And if you if there's inflation, you lose money. So, get get. Uh, uh, I wish I could tell you to get some investment advice, but I am very pleased with Fidelity. Fidelity does a tremendous job, and they've got all kinds of options for somebody. So have a look and at what, what they've got available to you. And I think you'll find something very satisfactory. All right. Okay, this is Ronell who says, hello, I'm hoping that someone in this show can help me find the answer to my question so I can truly accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior without a doubt. My question is, why should a person need to accept Jesus to be saved? To be saved for what? Please help me understand. <laughs> well, here's the deal. Uh, you know, our sins have separated us from God. God wants everybody to be saved. That's what the Bible says. It's the Lord's will that, that all should be saved and all would come to the knowledge of the truth.
but they don't. So we have sinned, you have sinned, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All your life, you've done things that are wrong. And the greatest sin of all is failure to put God first. And we have done our, our own thing. We are selfish in the way we've lived. Okay. Now, what, why do you need a Savior? Because if you continue that way, when you die, your spirit will go away to a place called hell, separation from God forever and ever and ever and ever. And if you come to the Lord and accept his death for your sins, you can be born again, and then you'll be a child of God. Then you'll live in heaven forever and ever. That's what you need to get saved from. You need to get saved from the consequences of the way you've lived over your life and what's down the road unless you do. All right? This is Joan who says, Pat, recently a discussion came up regarding the Bible's instructions on how to deal with sin in the church. Matthew 18, 15 through 17 tells us to confront the brother or sister and when all else fails, to treat them as a pagan or tax collector. Jesus <laughs> ate with tax collectors. How do we reconcile Jesus' example with Matthew's instructions? I wish people were, you know, you're too smart in half or whatever. <laughs> uh, you know, it's so, it's these complicated things. Look, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We're part of the family. And if you are born again, as you walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Christ continuously cleanses us from sin. Now, we don't have that same fellowship with ungodly people. We, we go out in the world with them. I mean, of course, you've got to deal with the world. You've got to, you know, buy and sell at grocery stores. You don't know if there's Christians or not. It doesn't, it's not really a factor. Is their food any good? You know, is the service good? You have telephones, you have people in the world, okay. So we deal with them, but what the Bible says, to treat somebody as, 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 as a, an unbeliever, you, you're not no longer a brother and sister, they're not part of the family. I think that's, that's it, all right. Okay, this is George who says, my son's wife left him. He has asked me and his mom to move near him to help with his business and our two young grandchildren. I've prayed about it and feel a peace that this is God's will for us. My wife initially told our son we would come and then changed her mind as she doesn't want to leave the security of her job and our home. I love my wife and I believe in honoring our marriage vows, which would mean staying here with her. But then I'm disobeying God and missing out on helping my son and being with my grandson. Any advice? Yeah, there's no question about it. No question. You know, for this cause shall a man leave his brother and f uh, mother and father and cleave to his wife, and the twain shall become one flesh. Uh, you've had children later on. Your first obligation is to your wife or your husband, always, not to your kids. I mean, you want to look after your children, be a good dad, and all that kind of stuff. But your first obligation to your wife, and the idea that you would leave your wife to help your son get some kind of a job in another community is nonsense. I mean, God bless you, you want to be a good dad, but your first obligation is to your wife. Don't, I mean, why would you even ask such a question? Okay, this is Randall who says, recently you had a segment about Christian leaders losing and walking away from their faith. My question is, in these cases, does God continue to pursue them? As a father, if my child was in trouble and had rejected me, I would pursue him. Could you please address this? Well, of course God will pursue you. Mm -hmm. You know, you will feel inside there'll be an emptiness. The person who's walked away from God will feel a continuous emptiness and the Spirit of God will always be striving and, and, and doing what He can to bring us back. But God won't violate your free will. You have free will, and you're a free will uh, person, mm -hmm. and God's made you that way. Okay? Okay. Is that, do we have time? I think, nope, that's all the that's time we have right. for now. So got, we need to move all right, on, thank we've you. got an amazing story right now. A rolling pin and dough. That's what a... Uh, came on her as she saw in a vision, and you'll never believe how it led to a multi-million dollar business. Watch this. It's been said some cooks are born, not made. 
and Ann Grimes agrees. I think I was born with a pan and a spoon in my hand. <laughs> By the time I was nine, I was baking cakes for neighbors and had a business going. Ann's love of cooking continued after she married. She and her husband started a local bakery. But after a few years, jobs in her town were scarce, and the people there moved out. All of a sudden, the town just dried up, and so there was very little business there. And we decided to just put our businesses up for sale and leave. Just before we left Southport, Brian received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and um, just became a totally different man in how he felt about God. Soon, Anne had her own life-changing experience. You know, I said, thank you, Jesus, because I realized at that point just how I felt was a special thing. Ann says their spiritual transformation affected everything, including their finances. They began tithing. Tithing is so important in the sense of it just releases God's blessings into your life. And then with her newfound faith, Ann asked God for financial ideas. I had a vision uh, one day back there of a rolling pin with dough. And so I thought, oh, that's what it is. God wants me to open another bakery. So the Grimes opened the rolling pin. And at that point, God said, don't make any more donuts. Don't make any more cakes. And I went over a period of weeks, and we got down to where the only thing I actually was making was the pastry. Soon, the rolling pin was selling pastry to grocery stores, restaurants, and wholesalers. Before long, sales went through the roof. Oh, my goodness. 200-fold, uh, 300-fold. I, I mean, you know, God's in the multiplication business, so <laughs> it's a lot. The rolling pin has expanded to become Harvest Time Foods, a company that sends Ann's old-fashioned food products around the world. Every box sold contains a scripture as a thanks to the God who opened doors because of her giving. If we give abundantly, we get abundantly. And this is just God's principle. It's one of his promises to us. And we speak God's promises into our lives, into our business. God is our supplier. He's our source. And as long as we look to him as the source for all and give into the kingdom of God, he's going to provide for you. So I just, you know, say thank you, God. What an amazing story. A rolling pin, a vision of dough and a rolling pin. You know, the guy uh, who was a businessman, he got in, you know, that um, uh, wonderful bakery. They, he said, I'm in the dough now, you know. But, uh, <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, if we want to invite you to be a part with us in reaching the world. You know, there are a lot of people who are suffering, hurting, all over the world, and we have such blessing here in this nation. We really do. And how do you, do you thank God? Well, you can thank Him, say, God, thank you for all this. But do you, are you aware, you know, uh, we hear about that, I won the ovarian lottery by, by being born in America. But we have so many privileges and we have such blessing. How do you show you're grateful? Well, one of the things you can do is to help your fellow man, somebody who is not as as well situated as you are. And there are people in this world who are literally living in poverty and are desperate need. And what can you do to help them? Well, we're out there with Operation Blessing and Orphan's Promise and other things that we do to help people. And we help millions and millions and millions to find faith, to find hope, to find joy. And how can you participate in that? Well, if you say to the Lord, I love you, Lord, I thank you. And the way I can do it is by giving to those less fortunate. And if you don't want to go over to Nigeria yourself, if you want to go into Latin America yourself, if you don't want to go into the slums of America with yourself, well, we'll do it for you. And how do you participate? Well, the 700 Club is just $20 a month. It's 65 cents a day. We're talking about junk food. I mean, that's, you know, what is a can of soda pop with a little bit of caffeine in it? What does it cost? You know, you, 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 you're not giving anything, but it makes a difference. $20 a month, and you can be a 700 club. And other you say, well, look, I can do a lot more than that. I want to give $50 a month or $1,000 or whatever. But uh, we want you to call 1-800-700-7000 and say, I love God. I want to help my fellow man because I know that you care about the poor and the needy. 
So call right now and say, look, you can count on me as a member of the 700 Club. 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, coming up later, a mom about to OD has an out-of-body experience. The second chance that saved her after this. Plus, we're going to be praying for you and your needs. It's all ahead on today's 700 Club. Stay with us. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News break. New York Senator Kirsten Gillibrand dropped out of the 2020 Democratic presidential race yesterday. The decision came after she failed to qualify for next month's Democratic debate in Houston, not hitting 2% in at least four approved public opinion polls. They ultimately showed her at 0%. The candidate has also struggled with fundraising, making it hard to get through the October debates, even if she did qualify. Gillibrand's campaign run has focused around the Me Too movement, racism, and white privilege. While the stage is set for that primary debate in Houston, the candidates you see on your screen have officially qualified for the September event. All of these White House hopefuls met the donor and polling requirements established by the Democratic National Committee. Since only 10 candidates qualified, it will be the first one-night debate in the primary held on September 12th. While polls still have former Vice President Joe Biden leading the pack, he has been slipping in recent weeks with Senator Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren closing in. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Sykes was struggling to breathe. Her heart was hammering in her chest. Her knees were buckling. In the next instant, she was out of this world and into another. Ever since she can remember, Kendra Sykes longed for the warmth of real love. But growing up, cycles of poverty and abuse made her tender heart grow cold. My father was very abusive to my mother. He suffered with uh, crack uh, addiction. And my mother was also an alcoholic, so there was a lot of fighting, a lot of arguing. Watching my mother um, be slapped or being choked, that was mentally draining for me. So I felt like I was failed as a little girl because that was my first experience of knowing how a man was supposed to treat a woman. At 14 years old, Kendra thought a baby would bring her the love she lacked. I wanted that love, and I felt like the only way that I was going to be able to get that is if I had something of my own. So that is when I started going around, giving my body to different guys. I got pregnant at 15 years old, and then I had my child, and then I realized that there was still this void missing. So for the next three years, she sought to fill the void the only way she knew how. I found myself in relationship with guys that I saw just like my father, abusive, um, that wanted to get high, and I honestly just didn't value myself. All I knew was to just go out, have fun, live life, and just go get what you're looking for. Around 18, Kendra met Ken. They had both dropped out of high school, and over the years, the couple had three children together. But Kendra says those years were tumultuous. They were daily getting high off cocaine, and Ken was increasingly violent and physically abusive toward Kendra. Somebody who didn't know how to treat a man, and then somebody who didn't know how to treat a woman, you get together and you have a big mess. We were two broken people, and we made a broken situation. For Kendra, life became unbearable. I remember I just felt so hopeless, and I felt like the only way of escape was suicide. I remember hearing things like, you should just go ahead and just take your life. This is all you have to hope for. And I remember just taking knives, and I would just cut my wrist. And I just felt like it was some sense of relief. But once I was done cutting, I was still here in this reality, and I felt like nothing was going to get any better. So I knew that there was a guy, there was somebody out there that did answer prayers, so I knew of him, but I didn't know him. I didn't have that close relationship with Jesus. At 23, Kendra was alerted to the fact that Ken was also physically abusing their children. I felt like that I failed as a mom because I knew that my children were being abused, and I felt like there's nothing I can do because I felt so weak at the moment. I felt like I wasn't a good mom because I just had these babies because I felt like I was trying to fill a void. And I wasn't giving them what they were needing, the same thing that I was looking for. I wasn't giving to my children. And I remember going to get high that night. 
just trying to fill the void of pain. I used cocaine from 9 a.m. all the way until like 6 o'clock that morning. Kendra overdosed. Afraid of dying, she prayed for a second chance. And I felt, it's like I felt my spirit was literally leaving my body. And my knees began to buckle and I remember falling down on the ground and I just called out to Jesus because I knew that that was my only hope. And I called out Jesus. Three times I called his name. I felt immediate strength in my body. Um, I was starting to breathe again. It was something that shifted inside of me. I began to feel a love that I've never felt before. I felt that somebody has to love me to give me a second chance at life. In that moment, I realized that everything that I had been searching for, every void that I had been trying to fill, was supposed to be filled through Jesus Christ. Kendra has been sober since that day. She began attending church regularly and reading the Bible. Through God's love, she began to see her life transform. He saved me. He gave me a second chance at life. So I want to live for him. The only thing that I craved was to get to know Jesus. Because if he loved me enough to save my life and give me another chance, I didn't want anything else. I began to view myself as a woman of value, a woman of virtue. I began to view myself as who God said I was. Eventually, Ken's heart changed too. But I remember beginning to pray for him. And God would wake me up at 3 o'clock in the morning. And he would tell, tell me, do you not think that I can do the same thing to him that I did for you? And my prayers for him began to change. There was a forgiveness that took in place. I began to pray that he would be delivered. I began to pray that he would be set free. Ken surrendered his life to Jesus, and their family began to heal and grow. Today, the couple is happily married. Kendra says she found the love she was looking for, and so much more. We're what it, what it means to be reconciled. We're what it means to be renewed and be redeemed. Now I know how to be a mother. We all go to church together. And it's just one big ball of happiness. Your past does not determine your future. If you're in a dark place, God can give you light. If you're broken, He can make you whole. He changed everything for me. He can redeem you. He can set you free. And He can change your path. You know, Kendra said, I knew about Jesus, but I didn't really know him. And maybe that's your situation today. Maybe you're stuck in the middle of all kinds of junk, stuff that's happened to you in the past. You know, one of the things that happens if we don't take care of that stuff, it just snowballs and then it starts to repeat itself, not just in our lives, but in the lives of our children as well. I want to say to you today that if you don't know Jesus, I mean know him, where that emptiness inside of you is filled, then hear this. Everything you do, all the effort you put forth, all the relationships you run after, all the things that you try to fill that emptiness with will not work. Whether it's sexual relationships, alcohol, drugs, whatever it might be, you are going to wake up the next day as empty as you were the day before. But it doesn't have to be that way. You were not created for that. We're created to have a relationship with our Creator. We're created to let His love fill us and fulfill us so that we know who we are, that we have a plan and a purpose for a life. We're going somewhere and it means something. You're not meant to lie around in a stupor because of what you did last night, feeling just as empty and confused. Listen, ask Jesus Christ into your heart and life today and begin the process of knowing him. It's a relationship, so it's going to take some time for that to develop. But the love is there right away. The forgiveness is there right away. The door opens right away. And you begin to fall in love with him in the way you were intended to. And you allow him to love the hurt and the emptiness and the brokenness out of you. How do you start it? You just ask. He's always there. He's with you right now. Call on his name. Call on his name. The Bible says anyone who does will be saved. Today's your day. Let's pray together right now. Just stop what you're doing and do it. Pray with me. Jesus, I need you. I've tried it all myself. I've failed at it all. My emptiness is still there. My longing to be loved, the lack of knowing why I'm here and what this is all about. 
Will you come into the core of my being, the very center of my life? Come into my heart. I ask you to forgive my sins. They are great and they are many, and I know you know them all. Would you wash me clean, Lord? Would you give me a new beginning? Teach me your ways to think your thoughts, to do the things that you would have me to do. Would you wipe the slate clean and then show me the stuff that needs to be worked on by me, the stuff I need to get rid of? Open your word up to me when I read the Bible. Let it come alive to me and create new life in me. I am giving everything I am and everything I have to you, and I'm asking you, Jesus, to do a miracle in my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. In your holy name I pray. Amen. If you've just prayed that prayer, what do you do now? How do you move forward? Well, we've got a packet for you. It's called A New Day, filled with wonderful information. Great thing is it's free. So is the phone call to get it. It's our privilege and pleasure to send this to you. 1-800-700-7000. Call now. We'll be right back to pray for you and your needs after this, so don't go away. Well, we want to pray for you in a second, but first I want to share this with you because I think it's so exciting. Mm -hmm. Marie lives in Manton, Michigan. She has a 24-year-old granddaughter, Acacia, who was found face down and unresponsive. She was rushed by ambulance to the hospital. Doctors gave her a grim prognosis, saying if she beat the odds and survived, only a 1% chance, she'd probably have brain damage. Her grandmother, Marie, is a 700 Club partner and called our prayer line. One week later, she called back to say Acacia had recovered completely and has been released from the hospital. Woo yes. <laughs> well, look, folks, we, we're going to pray for you right now. Nothing's impossible with God. So Terry and I will join hands. We'll believe God. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We bless the name of the Lord. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Thank you. Somebody, there's a lump. It's not a gorder, but it's a lump in your throat, and you're having a hard time swallowing. God has just, John, the Lord has just healed you. Terry, you have anything? Someone, you have a baby that keeps getting thrush, and you have, in, in their mouth, you've tried everything. It, it, you don't know what to do next. God is healing that for you. It's just not going to happen again. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, for everybody in this audience is struggling and suffering, may the anointing of the Holy Spirit touch them now. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name, receive an answer to your prayer. And Be made whole. Yeah, I Thank mean, you. If there's someone else too, yes. Pat, who has digestive problems. Amen. You have had it since you were a very young child. God's healing that for you right now. No more pain, no more issues in your life. It's just gone. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, today's Power Minute is from the book of Romans. God gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. Well, tomorrow, a mother is mauled by a berserk bear. You won't believe the miracle that saved her. That's on tomorrow's 700 Club. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.